analyst and advisor to the Chinese government on economic affairs. In Hong Kong, Frank Decoter, history professor at the University of Hong Kong. He's also the author of several books, including The Cultural Revolution, A People's History, and Mao's Great Famine, The History of China's Most Devastating Catastrophe. And finally, in Rome, Michele Garacci, head of China Economic Policy Research Program at Nottingham University. Welcome to all of you. Einer, I would like to start with you. How would you characterize this day in China's history? Well, it's um, kind of a bittersweet uh, anniversary. Uh, you'll notice that Xi Jinping did not make any reference to this day, although it's the 40th uh, anniversary of Mao's death. Uh, there have been uh, things going on in his hometown and in other areas uh, where they've been tr trying to celebrate it. He's a, obviously a controversial figure, uh, as the Chinese say, 7% good, 30% bad. But I think you have to see this day in the context of where Mao played out in the political uh, sphere in terms of the times that he was in and what resulted from it. Frank, your thoughts? Really, um, it's a regime that can hardly afford to criticize the man who brought them to power. Mao was both the Lenin and the Stalin of the People's Republic of China, hence his portrait on Tiananmen Square. Of course, it's not the Chinese people, it's the regime itself that in 1981 proposed that he was 70% good, 30% bad. But that doesn't mean that we should abide by a verdict pronounced by Deng Xiaoping some 30 years ago. I think many people in China have moved forward and have developed views which are far more critical than that. McKelly, I'd like your thoughts as well. Well, I think in a way the debate is a little bit uh, uh, passé. Uh, we do know that uh, in terms of uh, both economic and political uh, policy, today's China is completely different from what it was in the in the 50s, the 60s, and in the 70s. So discussing whether it was 30, 70 percent right or wrong, like Deng Xiaoping said many years ago, now it's not in people's mind. The people have moved on, and the only uh, reason to discuss uh, is the continuity in the name of the party, which still remains a communist party, whilst China has moved on beyond that. And it's a fully, oh, let's say, 70 percent capitalist, 30 percent socialist. Einer, who is, who is the most conflicted today about how to remember Mao? Well, you, you still have uh, small uh, groups within China, some uh, who agree with the Hong Kong professor's opinion that uh, things, but it's a very small group. And then you also have a very small group who kind of uh, adores him, believes that he was the founder of China. But I, I, I would agree with our, our thir uh, third voice in this, in that lionizing or demonizing Mao at this point is, uh, yeah, as I said, passe. The issue is, what is China today, and what role uh, did he play in that uh, beginning? And, and that's a fair discussion. That's going to be part of our discussion. But, but Frank, I'm curious if you agree with that. Is it, is it not relevant? Is it not important for, for China to have a, an honest reckoning uh, of who Mao was? Of course it's important. There's nothing passé about it. Um, to start with, I find it very difficult to see how we would know what people in China think of Mao Zedong or the Communist Party of China since they aren't allowed to voice their uh, opinions openly and critically. Uh, from the very beginning, from the moment that Mao passed away in 1976, there's been a very concerted uh, effort by the Communist Party to suppress any critical discussion of not only this man and the three decades of chaos he brought, but also of the larger uh, Communist Party at the time and the families who were implicated in crimes against humanity during, for instance, the Great Leap Forward, which caused tens of millions to, to die, not to mention uh, the Cultural Revolution. The very families in power today, the 50 powerful families of the Communist Party of China, have been there all along. And it is in their interest to make sure that it all looks as if it's not relevant and that it all looks as if it is somehow in a very distant past from from which China has moved on. But the reality is that the very party is the same, the structures are the same, the suppression of political rights is very much the same. It is impossible to understand China today without going back to 1949. Um, McKelly, do you, do you agree with that take, that it, that it is important to, to dissect and understand and analyze and accept all of who Mao was? Well, 
uh, you know, from a purely intellectual and philosophical point, point of view, maybe the issue is not per se. So perhaps uh, we scholars in the West uh, can use this uh, to write articles, books, uh, and philosophize about what happened uh, 60, 70 years ago. For the people of China today, which I, to be simplistic, I divide into two groups, people who are older and people who are younger. The people who are older have benefited not from the era of Mao, but from the last 30 years of economic reforms. So they don't really have any interest in putting into question the, the, the very foundation of what has made them relatively well-off citizens today. They do have memories, maybe they've suffered, but now they close one eye and they say, what I'm going to do? And I'm going to make a fuss about it and lose what I have gained since 1978 until today? No. So they don't really care. Young people, they have never experienced, 20, 30 years old people, they probably never experienced hunger like their parents and grandparents did. And yes, there is a small proportion of intellectual that, of course, uh, by the nature of the job, they need to ask themselves this question. They have pretty much no practical importance. Uh, I think, uh, uh, yes, we should understand the past. We in the West, but Chinese do not want to understand, do not care to understand. And to them, closing the eyes uh, is uh, better than opening up and find out things that maybe you don't want to know. Why would they put everything they have gained uh, in the 80s, 90s, and now at risk to gain what in exchange? All right, before we leave the past, um, I think there's there's a benefit to talking a little bit more about uh, Mao's ideology, and then we will move forward. Um, Einar, how would you characterize Mao's ideology as opposed to what actually came to be? Mao was a dreamer, and unfortunately, revolutionary dreamers are not necessarily the best people to be administrators, and it was very difficult to move from uh, motivating the people to overthrow a hundred years of humiliation, uh, the, uh, to get out the Japanese, and then move forward into a new ideological you know, nirvana. It just didn't work out that way. But this notion that the Chinese are silent on this issue is, I I'm afraid, I'd have to contradict that. I mean, most recently, a few weeks ago, there was a, um, a commemoration of red songs that were sung in the Great Hall of the People, and there was immediate and furious uh, out, uh, come, uh, outpouring on social media where people decried this. Uh, very prominent people, uh, 50 uh, <laughs> great families that our, our Hong Kong uh, professors uh, talking about, they were the first ones to jump in line because they were the ones who actually suffered the most in many cases. They were the ones who were sent out. So this is not something where there were 50 families sitting in the lap of luxury while Mao uh, went about his business. These were very, very um, bad times where people died. Uh, they were sent out in horrible circumstances. This was not a, a fun period. And if anything, it galvanized them. One, to make sure that there was never a famine like the Great Leap Forward, and two, that there would never be a return to the Cultural Revolution. So this, this conspiratorial stuff that goes on, uh, I think, yes, it's motive. It's, it's, it's very fun for the intellectual circle, but it has no real relevance uh, to China. In terms of what people know about it, I don't know that they, they close a blind eye to it. I think they look at it as a lesson of the past and something that they not necessarily want to go back to. Frank, let's talk about those things, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. How do you view, how do you view those, those disasters, and how do you view Mao's responsibility for them? Well, um, Mao's Great Famine, the Great Leap Forward that started in 1958 and uh, was pretty much over by 1962, resulted in um, the uh, deaths of uh, at least 45 million people. Uh, some of them started, starved to death, uh, others of them actually uh, beaten to death or worked to death, very much comparable to what happened uh, later on under Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Um, we have to understand that it wasn't simply that there was no food. It is much more that food was used as a weapon to punish people who wouldn't go along with whatever dictates local cadres had. All of the members, all of the high-ranking members of that party were implicated in this major crime against the humanity, including Deng Xiaoping, Zhou, Zhou, Zhou Enlai, Liu Xiaoqi. 
Um, so quite clearly, the effort of the party since 1978 has been to discuss a little bit the Cultural Revolution, but not to go back to the Great Leap Forward, since so many leading party members had a hand in what happened at that time. The Cultural Revolution, of course, is, is quite different. It is true that the party was torn to, to pieces by Mao, but what you have to understand is that it's precisely because of the Cultural Revolution that party members afterwards became determined never ever to allow ordinary people to speak up and criticize party members. That This is precisely what happened at the height of 1966 when Mao unleashed the population and allowed them to criticize any party member uh, at, at any level uh, of, the, of the hierarchy. And of course, this led to a social explosion on an unprecedented scale. And the one thing the Communist Party um, of China is very much determined in is to never allow people to have a voice again. Since 1978, the political aspirations have been constantly repressed. And this is the China we have today. On the one hand, very basic economic freedoms. On the other hand, absence of uh, political rights. Uh, that, that, that very sort of um, uh, contradiction there, that, that's, that, that very tension is a product that comes straight from the Cultural Revolution. Michele, it seemed that you wanted to add something to that. No, I kind of tend to agree. People in China are not, of course, allowed to express their political views. And I just add, uh, in most cases, they don't really want to do that. Uh, the, the flip side that was just mentioned, the, the, sorry, the economic freedom for the average Chinese person is enough. Um, we are a little bit sometimes uh, too uh, harsh, perhaps, on China. It's easy to criticize uh, the lack of democracy, the lack of electoral democracy. But I don't know what the average Western citizen uh, living in either Europe or the U.S. could do if, uh, for example, they were against uh, the invasion of Iraq uh, by the U.S. presidents. What can the average guy from Texas even do about it? Nothing. So let's not uh, over, in a way, emphasize the value of democracy in the hands of people, because we have very, very few examples around the world where people do influence decision by the government. There are so many layers in parliament, in direct, direct uh, uh, representative democracy that basically completely cuts people out even in uh, Western countries, members of the G8 family. So yes, let's discuss, let's uh, find out where China has made mistakes, uh, uh, but let's not fall into the trap that I think I may guess is coming next, to but, export democracy to China. All right, let's talk a little bit not more. Work. Sorry to interrupt. Let's talk a little bit more about um, some of what Mao's legacy is. Of course, he is regarded as the father of modern China and a symbol of the state. But many of his political and economic ideas, they've been abandoned, though some do remain. Let's take a look. Mao is credited with uniting China, defeating warlords, and cementing control over regions like Tibet. Since he died, Beijing has also resumed sovereignty over Hong Kong and Macau, and it's asserting its claims on the South China Sea. Mao pushed for strict control over all aspects of Chinese life, and the Communist Party maintains an iron grip over political power. People with alternative views in China are often seen as a threat to the state. One of Mao's most famous quotes is that political power comes from the barrel of a gun, and that's maintained in the strength of the People's Liberation Army. It is the world's largest standing military with more than two million members. But Mao's efforts to close China to trade and commercial interests have been rejected by his successors. China is now a modern industrial and capitalistic state, and it's the world's second largest economy. So, Einer, um, killer, you know, white cat, black cat, uh, cha crossing the river by, you know, feeling the stones. It was possibly the China that, that Mao envisioned. Oh. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Not even by the faintest uh, imagination. Um, Mao was uh, firmly wedded. I mean, if you if you look back, you know, everything that started in, in, in the communist ideology under Mao talked about this utopian society, uh, the workers, you know, uh, blah, 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 revolutionary, perfect society. But that stopped uh, when you Deng came in, and it was all about practicality. He changed the whole vernacular, you know, white cat, black cat, 
uh, crossing the river by you know feeling the stones. It was very very much different. And all the stop, all the talk about a um, you know a nirvana being reached also stopped. So it's been a very pragmatic time since then. So you know every, everybody has has long recognized that there's been two epochs in uh, modern China's history. That uh, Mao was responsible for unifying it, for getting rid of the uh, uh, territorial aggressors, not just the Japanese. Remember, I mean, it's fine to sit in Hong Kong and talk about ideology, <clears throat> but Hong Kong was created uh, because, the, the, you know, as a concession to the British, were insisting that they should be the drug dealers of choice in opium to China, uh, and other countries uh, piled in and took their own concessions. Uh, the number of people who died during that period is not a pretty thing. This does not excuse what ha happened, but it does point out that throughout history, when nations are created and times change, unfortunately, we as human beings seem to commit the same mistakes. Well, Frank, I had a question for you, but you're, you're shaking your head, so my question is going to be, go ahead and say what's on your mind. Well, I've, I've heard a lot of nonsense about China before 49, but, but to tell me precisely when did the communists defeat the Japanese? They were defeated by Chiang Kai-shek and the Americans in 1945. The reason why Mao managed to achieve power in 1949 is because Manchuria was invaded by the Red Army under Stalin. He didn't unify the country, it was already unified. He didn't get rid of foreign powers that already abandoned their concessions in 1943 during the Second World War. He didn't defeat the Japanese, they were defeated by Chiang Kai-shek in 1945. Uh, okay. What was your question? Einer? Uh, is, I mean, that might be Frank's view of history. I don't think that's what the accepted uh, uh, thing is. There was, in fact, a lot of discussions between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao as they were trying to form a national uh, coalition. I, I, I don't even understand where he's coming from historically. This doesn't even fit the facts. Uh, you, you can engage in this. It's, it might be very good for, for selling check, books, check but let's, let's try that to stick to the facts. Stop. This is about, what, it's about where things stand in terms of what, what Mao's legacy is. There's and, good and parts let, and, and let's bad pick, parts. Let's pick trying up to that demonize point, this gentlemen, is silly. Let's, go, let's go ahead and pick up that point. Frank, what would you say, what is the role that Mao's legacy plays right now for President Xi Jinping? Mao's legacy is that he was able to build up a very powerful one-party state, which is still in place to this day. The very structures of the state are, in this, are here to this day. Um, the very way it exercises power is with us to this very day. Um, the very control of a civil society, the crushing of dissent, the elimination of a, a, a legal system, all of that uh, is a consequence of the Mao era. So if you wish to talk about economic growth, that's all nice and well. But maybe it is also time to recognize that this wasn't somehow magically created by Deng Xiaoping with economic reforms in 1978, uh, but the result of uh, hundreds of millions of ordinary people who were actually allowed to just get on with it. It was the freedom that they managed to gain uh, throughout the Cultural Revolution because of the very chaos that Mao created. They wrenched away these very basic economic freedoms from the state. There was very little Deng Xiaoping could do about it. Um, so it's one thing to say that China has grown economically, but it's uh, also important to recognize that uh, it couldn't have been worse. Economic growth uh, was the only, the only option here, and it was very much created by ordinary people, despite the party, rather than thanks to it. Um, Einar, I will let you have the last word. Could there ever be another mouth? I, 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 I... Well, uh, hopefully not. Uh, I don't think that the, the current times dictate that you need somebody that's a strong-willed, and as I said, a dreamer, an ideological dreamer, not a realist, not a, an actuator. But in terms of this, I, I do think that in, in these discussions we should stick to facts, not opinions necessarily, and that we should look at it in, in terms of what he accomplished. I think I agree with part of what Frank said, but this stuff about the, the people rising up and, and doing this, this is kind of silly. He, on one side, he says that they, they are completely under the control of the Communist Party, and then on the other side, he says uh, they've read this revolution that's led to the uh, greatest uh, in, increase of 
decrease in the number of people in poverty uh, that the world has ever seen. So I think you have to make up your mind. All right, gentlemen, that will have to be the final uh, word on this. Um, and, and thank you for joining us for this conversation. Einar Tangen in Beijing, Frank Dekotzer in Hong Kong, in uh, Michele Garacci in Rome. And thank you for watching. You can watch the program again anytime if you go to our website. It's aljazeera.com.